Living in an urban world of segregation and poverty, she had no hope of escape. But the day she walked into her high school English class and met her new teacher, Erin Gruel, the seeds of change were planted. Eventually, Gruel connected with her students and their world began to change. They named themselves the Freedom Writers due to the journals they were asked to keep. And today, their stories being told on the big screen and the lessons they learned are inspiring change in schools all over the country. Hello, I'm Ernie Manus. Coming up on this episode of Interviews, our conversation with real-life freedom writer Maria Reyes. Why do you still have hope that things will work out between the races? Uh, I think we have to have it, I, I, or else I don't see a reason why to get up in the morning. I, I, I think that uh, with, with writing about what happened uh, in L.A. after the Rodney King riots and, and O.J. Simpson, um, I think I, it truly made me believe that when you write something down, it opens this, uh, this place of dialogue, of understanding. And I think that as long as people uh, want to talk about it and don't think that it's this taboo subject that nobody wants to talk about, um, I think that we will come to an understanding that, uh, that maybe separate is not always equal like we learned before and that uh, learning from one another is probably the best way to truly understand that we have uh, what bonds us together is so much greater than what uh, tears us apart. But throughout history, anthropologically speaking, socially speaking, groups have always tended to go together to separate and always seem to be warring against others, those that are different. Why would that ever change? I mean, is there something to be said about separate and living your own life? Why do we need to be together? Uh, sure, I think uh, it's because it's a comfort zone. Uh, it happened, you know, in uh, in at Wilson High School. Uh, th there was it was so diverse, but somehow we found people that looked like us, and those are people that we felt comfortable. Um, I think what happened in uh, Miss G's classroom in classroom room two or three was the fact that we were uh, able to see beyond the color of our skin. We were able to see beyond uh, cultural background or economic status or even religious beliefs. That that um, I think that uh, there's a there's a there's a common on a common understanding, and I think uh, the common denominator between all of us is human experience. And if you just understand that human experience on, in everybody's life, uh, you'll be able to understand that you could be with your own uh, in that other corner. But it's so much greater when uh, when you actually join somebody else in a conversation because you have a great understanding of yourself. And I think uh, th that's the beautiful thing that happened with all of us in Room Two Hundred Three was the fact that I was able to figure out things about my own life that made sense through the experiences of all these different people. I didn't have one teacher. I had 149 uh, teachers every day that taught me something about myself through their own experiences, and we were all different. Take me all the way back, though, because I think people would be, those that probably watch our show, the audience that we address through public television, is probably cut off in a lot of ways from the harsh reality of what you went through mm -hmm. in, urban, in the urban setting that you grew up in. Explain a little bit what that was like. You know, I think for, for most young people in urban America, um, whether you get jumped into a gang at the age of 11, uh, or you get jumped into a gang later in life, or even if you're not even part of a gang, the fact that you live in a poor neighborhood, um, whether it's a hood, whether it's a barrio, whether it's a, a, a ghetto, whatever you want to call it, it's the same thing. Whatever label you want to put on it, it's the same thing. And, and you don't have to be part of a gang to, to, uh, to get sucked into it, to believe that sometimes fighting back is the only way. Um, I don't think you have to be part of a gang to, uh, to feel like you're the only one that's going through that certain experience. And most importantly, uh, that you don't have to be in a gang to feel like you need to belong to something. And I think uh, young people nowadays, um, just like it was in 1994, they have this desire to, to, to feel part of something because nothing is grabbing them. Nothing is grabbing them to say, you are here and you are important. And I think, uh, unfortunately, gangs do that for a lot of young people, not just Latinos, not just blacks, but as you see, um, as we saw in California in the mid 90s uh, was the Cambodian gang. There was a rise because even though they had uh, had this uh, horrible tragedy in their own country, most of them, their parents were refugees um, in, in Long Beach. Nobody passed that down, that history of genocide and what happens when you don't understand your history. And they all started uh, wanting to have that that feeling of belonging. Uh, and I think uh, uh, in L.A. especially, there's gangs that have been first, second, third, 
generation. And for a lot of young kids, they feel like they don't have another choice. This is what I have to do because they don't see beyond their own neighborhood. What would, what's your remembrance of the Rodney King and of the O.J. Simpson verdict? How did that affect the community you were living in? Well, you know, if, if, if you live in L.A., uh, there, there's, there has always been this horrible history with, the, with LAPD, unfortunately. I um, mean, you could go all the way back from the Zoot Suit Riots, uh, and especially in East L.A., there's always been this hostel, uh, hostility uh, against LAPD because you hear stories as a young kid, uh, uh, whether it was your grandparents or the neighbor or even your parents, talking about how the police used to come and used to harass, you know, all these Mexicans uh, because of the way they looked or, or or uh, where they were hanging out, and just because they could. And I think uh, when you experience that yourself, you're like, yeah, that, that was right. What my grandmother said was right. What that my neighbor said was right, that they do just come and harass us. So there's always been this struggle between the, you know, the law and the laws of the streets and which one you follow. And uh, I think that the, the Ronnie King riots was just a justification for everything else. The fact is that nobody was shocked that a black guy was getting beat down by LAPD. We saw it all the time. Time, whether it was a black guy or a Mexican guy, whatever, a brown or black, whatever it was. What was shocking to all of us was the fact that it was actually a national television and people, uh, people were like, oh, does that really happen? Well, that's what everybody was saying in, uh, in rap music. Uh, people were talking about it in, uh, you know, in the evening news. It's just that nobody was really paying attention. Uh, and I think uh, uh, I, I always tell people that uh, th that that scene of him getting beat up played over and over and over and over again. And for people like uh, my grandparents or my parents, it just kept a, a reminder that it wasn't even about um, Rodney King. It was the times that they got harassed. It was the time that they got arrested for something that they didn't do. So what did your parents say to you when these images were being shown? It, it was, a, uh, it, I think it was uh, something that, you know, oh, yeah, you know, that's what happens. You know, see, now they're going to see. They're going to see that that's what happens. So there was, in a sense, there was this, like, oh, now they're going to see. Now they're going to see what we go through. Now they're going to see that we do get profiled because of the way we look and, and what neighborhood we're from uh, or how we dress. Everybody's going to see now. And I think uh, the devastating part was the fact that when they didn't get convicted, when they were not found guilty, um, it was like telling everybody in L.A. that the rest of the world didn't care, uh, that the rest of America didn't care. And... Um, uh, and because they had a uniform with a shiny badge, somehow made it okay for them to be down on somebody that didn't have that power. Uh, and, and I don't think it was so um, so much about the, the 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 color of skin there. It was it was the it was the power balance that they had it and we didn't. And I think um, the fact that there were white cops and Ronnie King was a black man uh, just added to that. Did it make a separation though for you and your community that he was black? This Absolutely not, which is which is oh incredibly interesting, because uh, we didn't even see that. We saw that he was. What happened was showing what happens all the time, uh, and like I said, whether it was a brown guy, a brown man, or a black man, um, we were finally somehow relieved that people were going to see it. So then, why didn't this bring? the brown and the black communities together? Why didn't this bring all of the minorities, the Asians, all together saying, look, it, we all have this same problem? Why then the splinterization? Because I think uh, there's there's this struggle um, in L.A., and I've seen it in, in a lot of communities, not, not just in California, where uh, there, there's like, well, we have it the worst. You know, we're the real minority. And I think in L.A., there's there's like, well, you know, we struggle more. Uh, we get profiled more. Well, we don't get, you know, those other jobs. Uh, and, and I think... Uh, Instead of understanding that we're struggling together, everybody's trying to up the other one. Well, this is what they did to me. Well, this is what they do to me when I catch the bus or, you know, I get arrested or whatever. So there's this comparison of who has it the worst because somehow when you have it the worst, it gives you a, a right to complain. It gives you a right to go down and, you know, go, go burn a building or whatever it is or, or hit a cop. It gives you a justification for, uh, for not... Uh, creating or somehow entertaining that you can make the right choice and you could do something different. And, and I think uh, that 
once people start understanding that we're fighting the same struggle, we are fighting the same fight, and uh, and finally, I think when people truly understand that is when we're going to start changing it. Instead of saying, well, who did it? Uh, you know, people are like, well, MLK was a black guy. Everybody tries to claim it. It's the same thing. You know, who are the greatest leaders? Let's try to claim them. I, I, and, and it happens in my own in my own community, my own culture. When when a, when a Latino does something special, we want to be the first ones to claim it. The yeah. same thing, I think, happens with the struggle. Uh, and uh, there's this sense of, of feeling like you're part of something else. And whether it's a bad thing or a good thing, you just want to be part of it. What was your home like, life like that led to you getting into a gang at 11? Is it, can we look back and say, broken home, parents didn't care, and that's why you looked for gang support or what? I think, I think in, in my case, and in, in a lot of people actually during that time, uh, it wasn't so much that we didn't have uh, caring parents. I, I tell young people all the time, including uh, adults sometimes that don't understand why, and not just my parents, but Freedom Rider parents in general, why didn't they fight for you guys to have better schools and better teachers? And, and I always tell people, I had a wonderful home. Uh, my parents were hardworking, uh, and uh, they, they, I was loved. I, I felt love every day. Uh, my, my mother told me I was beautiful every day. I never, I never grew up with, uh, with the complexity of, of, oh, I wish I was something else, or I wish I was taller, or I wish I was thinner, or, or thicker, and nothing like that. And I think um, the, the only trouble, the only problem in my home was the fact that there was this sense of, um, of the, the, the absence of American dream, because it didn't happen for my grandparents. Um, it didn't happen to, to, to my parents, so why are they going to pass down this broken American dream to their child? Because you're preparing them to be disappointed. And I think uh, because we look around our neighborhood, and I didn't see anybody that had made it out. I didn't see any special heroic people in my neighborhood. Uh, the only people you see are gang members. The only people you see are drug dealers. The only people you see are people struggling just like you are. There's nobody special there. Do you see hope, though? in being a gang member. At that point, do you look at that and say, no. that's a way out or that's a way of survival? That's a way of survival. That's a way of survival in a world that, uh, that nobody understands. In a world that nobody knows how it is to uh, to learn that when a car is driving by really slowly, it might be a drive-by, so you you have to duck down. Nobody understands that you have to be careful what color you wear because you might be wearing uh, red in a, in a crib neighborhood, or you might be wearing blue in a blood neighborhood, or uh, your family or your friend that they saw you with, you know, a few months ago, and they're gonna recognize you, might jump you, or might you know shoot at you, or whatever it is. Uh, young people uh, are so savvy because they have to figure that out by the age of 11, by the age of 10. This is going on in elementary schools and middle schools, not just in high schools. And uh, I think uh, you get the sense that uh, you are the only one and you have to do whatever you do to survive in that world. You're not sure why you're surviving it, but that's what everybody else is doing. So at 11, you become a member of a gang? Uh, yeah, uh, because I thought there was no other choice. There was no, I didn't, like I said, you don't see any examples of anybody else doing anything different. You don't see it on TV. You don't see it in the big screen. You don't see it in your, in your neighborhood. You don't see it in your parents or your grandparents. So where are we supposed to get this example of, of making it out, of fighting the good fight somehow, and it's going to pay off at the end? I saw my mother working hard every day of her life and never, got, uh, never had anything to show for it. I, I saw my father struggle every day and never had anything to show for it. So I think uh, growing up, I, I didn't understand this sense of hard work. I didn't understand the sense of, oh, I'm going to uh, and go get an education. And somehow that's going to change things for me. Do your parents, though, at this point see what's going on, and how do they react? How do they get involved or don't? You know, I think uh, in, 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 in my neighborhood, in, in most neighborhoods, actually, uh, not just mine, uh, there's this sense of what else, what can we do? What can we do when I'm working three jobs? What can I do when I speak broken English? What can I do when I feel like I don't have any resources uh, to, to help my child? And, uh, and I think that you just don't understand how it is for your child to survive, whether it's in a school or walking home from school. And uh, I think for, for, for my mom, it was just the, the fact that they worked so hard that they didn't know what else to do. 
Um, they were just too busy trying to work that extra third job to make sure that the lights were on and to put food on my table. That sometimes you don't, you don't see the little things that are going on or how your kids are changing. And I think I see that in so many homes across the country when uh, you, you don't have a lot of money, uh, your parents are working, there's you know two or three kids, kids in the home, and the parents are just like, I have to get up the next morning and do it all over again. And then I think that as long as they feel like I'm feeding my kids and I'm putting clothes on their back and somehow they're safe, then I'm going to be okay. They're going to be okay. Um, and I think um, for, for, for uh, a lot of uh, communities, uh, there's a sense of conformity yeah. because you just don't see anything else. And, and I think for us and as well as for our parents, that's what they see. And why would they think that their kids were going to be any different? And then your life all changes or starts to change, I guess is the best way to put it. English class in high school. Yes. 1994, 14 years old. Uh, I, I, I tell young people all the time when I, when I have the opportunity to share my story, the freedom writer story, really. I'm just one person, uh, and there's 150 of us. I, I represent 149 other people, and uh, I truly believe that our story wouldn't be as beautiful or as powerful if it wasn't because all, this, this, all of these different stories came together to share one story uh, because our story together means so much more. It gave meaning to all of our lives. Uh, and I think uh, when I answered Ms. Girls' class, in 1994, I was so angry. I was so angry because I, at a very young age, I think something was taken away from me. That that um, that belief that you have as a young child that you could do anything. I was compared to. Uh, to having that uh, that feeling that Santa Claus somehow is going to come on, on you know December 25th and somehow a present shows up you know under the tree and you believe that and nobody could tell you anything different and I think uh, for a lot of us uh, when we see uh, the ugly side of the world the ugly side of life at such an early age that's taken away from you it's raw from you you give it up and you don't even realize it and I think Ms. Grau um, gave us that belief back believe that anything is possible and we believe that in that room how did she reach you though you come in with all of these different students, and you've mm -hmm. all got stories similar to yours. Mm -hmm. You've all got parents that love their children, mm -hmm. love their family, or some did, and yet there's despair, there's no hope, there's nowhere to go. You come in from bad education leading up to there Absolutely. because nobody cared. How can one person make a difference in all of you guys? I think Ms. Gura, and, and I love to describe this, she was so idealistic. She was so idealistic and she was naive. And, and I think naive has a, has a negative connotation because when people say that you're naive, it's supposed to be a bad thing. Why but, didn't you guys rip her apart then? Why? Um, How did she Oh, we did. We did. <laughs> Believe me, we did. And we try to break her every day because for a lot of us, we, we saw that, you know, oh, here again comes the gray white hope trying to save those ghetto kids. We saw it on TV before. There was, there was movies about it. Uh, so we knew that feeling. We knew that a white person would come to the ghetto and would try to reach out and help you for that one hour, for that community service, and make them feel good about themselves. And as soon as, as, as quickly as they walked into, the, into your world, they would walk out. So we knew that sooner or later she was going to get it. She was going to get it that we were not the kids that were like, ooh, I know the answer, you know, waiting to blurt it out and <laughs> turn in our homework early to get extra credit. We were not those kids. We were not the status quo students uh, because we, we were below average. We scored below average on a test, and, uh, and our schools believe in tracking kids at a very young age, and that's what we ended up in our classroom. And we knew without a doubt that she was going to be just like every other white person, just like every other white teacher that was like, you know what, I better go across the hall with the distinguished scholars and with those honor students, the ones that do raise their hand and their parents come to back to school at night and pat, my, and pat me on the back and tell me what a great job I'm doing. So the fact that um, every day we would walk into room 203 and she was standing there with a smile, you know, from ear to ear, um, just waiting to teach you. She was so hungry for that. She was so hungry to, to pass that passion, that love for literature that she had. And I think um, her father, Papa G, as we uh, very caringly uh, dubbed him with that name because we called her Miss G. He was Papa G. I think uh, the fact that he instilled in her uh, this this sense of anything is possible, and if you believe in, in something, it's gonna it's gonna become a reality. And if you work hard, it's go it's gonna come true. And I think uh, because she believed in her father's words, that's why she never gave up. She never gave up on the fact that the first day of school, she thought she had the most 150 most intelligent students, and that she had 150 uh, students that were gonna graduate from high school and go on to college and do great things. And she never wavered from that belief. Do you remember, or can you share with us personally, the moment it clicked for you and you decided to give her a chance? What led to that for you? You know, I have to tell them this girl was humble enough. 
She was humble enough to know that she came from a, pri a privileged background and that there was no way that she would a a ever be able to relate to our stories. That I, and, or, or, or even the fact that she was humble enough to realize that we would never listen to this white person in front of a classroom trying to tell us something about where we come from and with her white privilege that, that could not understand um, the struggle that, 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 we, that we faced every day. I think uh, she was able to bring in books um, about uh, young people that had a choice, that had it worse than we did, because young people love to believe that they have it the worst. There's nobody that has it worse than they do. <laughs> not we just young like people that. believe yes, that. Yes, <laughs> you know, we, we all love to believe that. Yeah. And, and uh, I think uh, because she brought in um, the Diary of Anne Frank, this little girl that at the age of 15 perished because uh, 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 of what she believed in, uh, had, not, had done nothing wrong, was, you know, the epitome of goodness, and somehow she didn't make it. She brought in books by Ali Wazell, Knight, uh, this young man that lost his entire family and somehow made a choice uh, to do something different. Uh, Slata Pilof uh, Filipovic, the little girl in Bosnia that was dubbed, you know, the new Anne Frank of, of the century, um, and she made another choice to write about it. But you can bring these books, it. you can bring these stories to you guys, but I would think, and I've seen rough classes in my day, what was it though that finally you said, okay, I'll read this, as opposed to, yeah, another book? Two Why? Things. Okay. Uh, I think young kids love a good challenge. If I was given the opportunity to prove a teacher wrong, I would take it and I would run with it because we we all wanna uh, we all wanna be uh, that uh, that person that cracks that teacher, that makes her cry, that that is gonna run to the principal's office and ask for her leave. So we all wanted that. We were all hungry to to break her that way. So when when um when she told us that we were gonna be able to relate. To these, to these books, that somehow we're going to find ourselves within the pages of these books. I was like, okay, I know she's full of it. I know she's full <laughs> of it because there's no way that, you know, this Latina, this Chicana from, you know, from L.A. is going to be able to relate to some little girl that I never heard of before from a country that I probably can't pinpoint on a map um, that I'm going to be able to relate to her somehow. So I started reading this book. I was doing it at a fourth grade level, sophomore in high school. And I struggle with every word. And at first I was like, what is she talking about? Who cares? And, and it came, I think... Um, it was her words that when she got captured, I mean, I'm sorry, when, when she started, um, uh, when she, her family started hiding, that I truly started creating this bond with her. And I, at some point in the book, I truly felt that 50 odd years ago, she had written this book, this diary for me to read um, in 1995 in, in my bedroom. Uh, because every word that, that, that she was describing was the way I had felt my entire life, and I just never had the right words, the right language to describe it. And, uh, and I think uh, at the end of her book, when she talks about how despite of everything, she still believes that people are good at heart, I, I didn't understand that. Because at, you know, up, up to that point, I was like, man, she's my girl. You know, I, I know exactly what she's talking about. She's talking about putting the yellow star on your shoulder and not being able to take it off because you, you might get shot at. And uh, you, you might be dead for taking out because everybody needed to know that she was a Jew. And, and even though I didn't have to wear the yellow star on my shoulder, I wore the color of my skin every day. And I knew what, what, it, what it felt like to be discriminated. I knew what it felt like to, to be called uh, a dirty Mexican or a wetback, even though um, I, I was you know, here my entire life and knew nothing about me and people already making that judgment about me. But at the end of, of, of that book, I, I was like, I can't, I can't understand her. I can't feel her on that because I hated anybody that had done anything wrong to me or to my family or to my friends, and I didn't know uh, how to forgive. And because Ms. Girl taught me how to critically think, I was able to understand that that's what she was referring to. She was referring to forgiveness. And I think that I truly understood that you have to be able to let go, let go of, of, of the wrongs that your parents made and the mistakes and, and, and in your neighborhood or that judge or that, that teacher that didn't believe in you. Once you let go of that, that'll be the only way that you're going to be able to move forward and feel like she felt that despite of everything, everybody's good at heart. And, and I think it gave me hope to myself because as a young person, when you do bad things, nobody grabs you by the hand and say, hey, you know, you just made a bad choice. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. And I think for most young people, that's why they have to put in this act that how tough they are and, oh, look at how bad I am because they don't think they're good people. Uh, and I think uh, for the first time in my life, I felt that I could be a good person. Had it not been for that book, had it not been for that teacher, that class, do you imagine where you would be today? You know, I, I think that if, if Ms. G wouldn't have um, given me that light, and I say that light because that's what that book was for me. I think uh, for, for myself, I was living in this world of darkness, and that book uh, brought me to the light again. And Erin Girl didn't change my life. I did that. I did that. 
And Erin uh, Girl, the only thing she gave me was that belief, that belief that I could change. And she gave me that second chance when, when pe everybody else had given up on me. And I think that, that that book to me became the philosophy of my life because I thought if there's this little girl that has seen the worst tragedy in human history and she made a choice uh, to write about it, and, and, and despite the fact that she's gone and we are still talking about it right now, that, me that meant something to me. And it meant something to me because I thought about how I wanted to be remembered. What was I going to leave behind in this world that was going to mean something? That 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 was going to that was going to somehow make it a better place for my kids or, or for somebody else's kids. Uh, and and it made me really think about my own responsibility in this world. And and, and it made me desire. And it made me be hungry to to uh, really go after my rightful place in society. Yeah. In the couple seconds we have left, eventually you all started journaling. The journals were That's put right. together yes. into a book. Yes. I think the core of everything that happened in that room, and so many beautiful things happened. Um, it all came from reading and writing. Erin Gu accomplished what she wanted to accomplish the first day. She wanted us to love reading, and she wanted us to love writing. I keep a journal to this day because it makes me reflect, it makes me understand, it makes me figure things out for myself, and most importantly, it makes me understand that when you are a powerful being and you see the light, uh, you will go after whatever you want, and you will be that little five-year-old when you get up on December 25th with that present under the tree, that you know somehow there's something bigger out there for you, that there's a higher being somehow, and you have to do what you can to make this world a better place. I have nothing more that I could ask you. You tell the story amazingly. Thank you. Thank Maria you so Reyes, much. Thank, thank you so you. much for sitting thank down Thank you for with allowing us. me to share uh, the Freedom Writer story. Thank you. Maria Reyes. Transcript, call 866-652-3378 or send 695 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest. Mm -hmm.